Sheldon, that was a great episode of uh, The Challenge last night, an exciting episode of The Challenge last night. I loved the competition. Mm -hmm. Uh, You loved the competition. It was such a good competition because, first off, just the little details, right? Like, they could have done that during the day, but I think doing it at night just added another level of, like, weirdness to it or, like, strangeness or maybe up the ante on difficulty just because that shit looked scary. Yeah. Right? That's some scary movie shit. And I'm a brother and we don't survive those. <laughs> but, but, I think the real crux of last night's episode of The Challenge was all about the mystery of the notes being left mm-hmm. in the room with uh, Veronica and Cara Maria and Jemmy and Brittany about Brittany. Mm-hmm. And longtime listeners of You Killed It might recognize that when you hear John Chidley Hill and Sheldon Alexander and we're sitting in the same room together, it means that we've got a guest. Yes. So we got a special guest for this episode of You Killed It, the chief house detective <laughs> for the Challenge House on Vendettas. We've got Jemmy on the podcast. Yeah. So after the bumper music... We're going to come straight at you with a solid hour and 15 or so of conversation with Jemmy, and she spills a lot of tea. She gives a lot of really interesting behind-the-scenes details, including the fact she still doesn't know who left those notes. But we have some clues. We have some clues. We we look into it, guys. Don't worry. (laughs) So come back after the music. And you'll hear our conversation with Jemmy. So, uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming on. You killed it. We really appreciate it. And no, thanks for having me. It seems really timely given the mystery of the notes <laughs> in the Vendetta household. <laughs> can we can we start there and you can tell us from your perspective what went down yeah we well, want to start and kind of get the behind the scenes of the note and exactly how it all played out yeah that'd be great okay so essentially what happened is and you know with with television things are edited so i actually found that note the day before Brittany went into the was supposedly go elimination so i found the note when they voted Melissa, Kaylee, and Brittany into the Inquisition. So someone was really trying to get into Brittany's head before she was possibly going into elimination. I find the note, I only tell Veronica and Shane. And then Shane tells us this outrageous story about him being there when the note was delivered and about everything that Shane happened that y'all saw with Shane. He told us, and we literally thought he was lying. We were like, there's no way someone slept through someone coming into the room, never lifted up his eye mask, like, Shane, you're fucking lying. (laughs) It all now comes out that Shane is, in fact, telling the truth, and I, we all had to apologize to him, because we all called him a liar. So we find the note, my gut instinct is Marie, because her and I are very good friends, and I'm like, this is someone close to us, either Shane or Marie. Shane obviously was there when it was happened. So I wanted to wake Marie up immediately. Like, Marie, what's going on? It is this you? But Veronica and Shane didn't want to do it. They kind of wanted to let it play out. So we don't tell anyone about the note for a day or two. And then we tell everyone. And it's just theories upon theories upon theories. And then Brittany gets another note. So at this point, we know that people are fucking with us or yeah. fucking with Brittany for a reason. Mm-hmm. I will tell y'all, I have pretty strong confirmation that we will find out next episode who wrote the note. But at this point, I have no idea. I am more confused at this moment than I was months ago when the note actually happened. So I'll be finding out, Car, Brittany, Veronica, we're all going to be finding out when y'all find out, and I think it's going to be next week. See, that was going to be my next question. I assumed that, like... In the house, you guys, like, found out what happened. No, that's the thing. This note, whoever did this, or whatever persons, people, whoever were involved, their secret is still out there. Like, there's so many theories. Like, we were, me and Cara were just with Leroy in Orlando. 
Yeah. We spent like 35, 40 minutes accusing him of the note. And then I think, well, maybe it's this person, maybe it's this person. So honestly, gun to my head, pick someone right now. I have zero clue who wrote this note. <laughs> wow. I, but I mean, and there's four notes to come. Like, two notes were revealed last night to Brittany. There's another note coming to someone else in the room. So this note game is literally escalating. <laughs> That's incredible. It's funny. I saw, I think it was Veronica tweeting about how she thought for sure that it was Shane until you actually saw the trailer where Shane's clearly asleep on the floor. So it, I mean, it's funny that yeah, it's, I mean, he was suspicious, but he was actually telling the truth. I mean, in all seriousness, this note caused a lot of drama, like real life drama too. Veronica and Shane have been friends for 11 years. They've been through like some life obstacles together, ups and downs. And it really had her questioning her best friend, one of her best friends in real life. So whoever wrote this note, they kind of got what they wanted, which was to cause the drama, cause the controversy, get people kind of questioning, backstabbing each other. And this note drama is going to play out through the season because we don't know who it is, so we're going to start turning on each other. Wow. How, how yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a shit show. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> There's so much, like, mental part of this house in general. It's just a mental fuck 24-7. Yeah. And then you add something like this, and it takes it to a whole different level. This is awesome too, Jemmy, to talk to you about this situation because I feel like you might be the pers- the perfect person to ask about this because we always discuss how there's two sides to the game, right? There's obviously the physical challenge and, you know, being able to compete in the competitions and all that stuff. But there's a whole other side to the game that is probably just as, if not more important than the actual physical challenges. And that part would be you know, the the mind games, you know, the mind games that go on within the house, the people skills, the politicking that has to go on. And I just want to know from your perspective, how does this note play into that? But also, how do you see yourself as a player within this game? No, great question. Um, First and foremost, I think in order to be able to compete in these challenges, you have to know where your strengths lie and you have to know where your weaknesses are. And I am very aware that you know, my brain and my mental ability to play this game, my uh, political ability to kind of see through everyone and make the right decisions is my strength. I know that I'm not a car when it comes to competition. Um, I never will be. It's just not who I am. It's just not who I am. So I have to use my strength, which is my mental game. And this note, like I said, it definitely caused a lot of controversy and decisions are going to be made in later episodes based on this note oh. friends are kind of going to turn on each other i mean you're going to see me and marie definitely go from being friends to a whole different level then and it all comes back to this note because in my mind marie could have possibly wrote the note and i didn't know if she was innocent or guilty so it's going to cause a lot of drama within real friendships oh okay have you and marie recovered as friends um me and marie are definitely i mean me and Marie are a kind of a different level. Her and I have known each other for years. We have a real friendship outside of this house. So no matter what happens in that game, me and Marie are always going to be okay. She's like family to me. And I think she, and she feels the same way to, about me. So we're family. But if Marie is known, I am not going to be happy. Like, <laughs> I want it to be anybody but Marie because I don't want it to be her. Aside from Marie, who do you think the top suspects are? Since Shane has had his name cleared. That's the thing. Like, you always, I mean, watching that video, I'm like, Leroy, it looks like you. That blob walks just like Leroy. (laughs) So now I'm starting to think, did Leroy deliver the message for one of the other girls? Did he deliver it? Is Johnny somehow involved? Because he's always involved in everything. Like, that's the thing. I can't even give you a concrete list of suspects because I genuinely don't even know where to start. I've had plenty of people tell me, Kayla's told me, from day one, Kayla was like, it's not me, it's not me. Even to this day, Kayla tells me it's not her. So I have plenty of people that's like, it's not me, and have told me repeatedly. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to know who to believe until it's revealed. Wow, that's crazy. So No, whoever did this, like, despite that it was done to me in my room, it was really beautifully executed. Because here we are, the show's airing, most secrets we find out in the house 
the show's airing and we still don't know who did this. Like the entire house still doesn't know. So it was beautifully executed. I'll give that person props. <laughs> I think it's a bitch move to leave notes, but I think people are allowed to play the game the way that they want to play the game. And this note is part of the game. So with the note, like I obviously know the role that the note's playing in this, but I want to kind of get to the question the note brings up, which is every time Brittany's not in the room, the girls are talking shit about you. Now, I don't think you, like, watching you on TV, right, and you, and the funny thing is you mentioning how cool you and Marie are, the reason why I enjoy the both of you, because you guys both seem to give zero fucks. Like, you guys don't strike me as a people that would talk behind someone's back. You would more so say whatever you have to say to someone's face. But my question regarding the note is, what do you think of Brittany? That is a great question, and I think what pissed me off so much about the note is it was a blatant lie. Like, if I talk shit about someone, you're going to see it constantly in my interviews. You're going to see it in my, you know, when I'm hanging out with Veronica. But I never talk shit about Brittany because Brittany is one of my really good friends. And Brittany's the type of person, anything that I want to say to Brittany, I can say to her face, and she doesn't really get offended. Like, if her and I were having issues, I would say it to her face. I've never talked bad about Brittany behind her back. So that's what really pissed me off about the note is, okay, if you're going to come into our room, disrespect us, at least tell the truth. Don't make up lies. That was kind of my biggest issue. There's enough truth in that house to be told. You don't need to make up lies. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And it, it seems like it's exactly what you're saying, that both you're a very forthright person but that also Brittany has like a tough enough skin where that if you have an issue with her, you, you can be open and honest. Exactly. In the episode, in the week before episode, you tell, you see me tell Brittany to her face, yeah. you are not smart enough right now to be playing a political game. Like you need to chill out. Like everything. I literally said that to her face and it was fine. So there's no truth to us talking shit about Brittany behind her back. Mm -hmm. Other people, absolutely. Brittany, definitely not. I like what you said earlier about the low key chance that bananas is behind this. Cuz I just wait, feel wait, like I can't hear you. Can you start that over? I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I was saying I was saying I like what you said earlier about the possibility that bananas could be behind this just because he strikes me as someone who always enjoys stirring the pot, always wants to be, you know, if he's not at the center of the drama, at least the center of creating the drama. So he might not deliver the note himself, but he's definitely involved. I mean, here's one of my theories. Um, it was Banana's idea. For whatever reason, he wanted to go after our room, probably to get me and Veronica stirred up. He knew that fucking with me and Veronica would cause some, you know, drama because we both are kind of, we can have a temper at times. Mm -hmm. So if it is involved and Leroy was the one delivering the note, then a girl was writing it. That is 100% a girl's handwriting. So maybe it was Banana's idea, Leroy was delivering, but there is a girl involved that was writing the note. And in that case, the only two girls that I could see really writing a note for Banana would be his two girlfriends, Natalie and Kaylee. Oh. So then maybe possibly one of them is involved. Okay, that makes sense. There's I... so many angles here. It's either <laughs> like Marie's room doing it, it's Johnny, Leroy, and one of those rookie girls doing it. There's someone we haven't even thought about doing it because they've stayed under the radar. There are so many options and theories here, and I'm not going to know what to believe until I see it, and then I'm still probably not going to believe it. <laughs> it does seem like the usual suspect of the challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's someone that plays this game and knows what they're doing. And someone was brave enough to deliver it while she's there. That blows my mind. So you, you and Johnny are having a pretty interesting season. I say that oh, because... Oh, I'm so glad that you brought this up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest, watching it, and we've discussed this on this podcast, as soon as the Natalie and Johnny Bananas thing started, I watched Big Brother. So I was very familiar with Natalie ahead of time and what she did on her season of Big Brother. So even on this podcast, we were discussing the fact that I wasn't buying this little showmans from the get-go, right? It just seemed too contrived and too phony. So I was super happy when you were just giving zero fucks and calling them out right away every chance you got. Why was it so important to you to do that and be that upfront with your feelings? 
front house and one of my kind of streaks I guess is I have the ability to kind of see everything that's going on it's, it's how I am in real life if I'm at a party I kind of know what's going on everywhere just because I'm nosy as shit <laughs> um and from the beginning like I knew I never watched Big Brother but I knew that Natalie came from Big Brother I didn't know anything about her past and how she's used guys before in the game to advance herself and I never knew that but I caught on to it immediately like Oh, you ironically have a crush on Johnny of all people? Like, come on, girl. Like, I <laughs> see through your shit. And with Johnny, like, he's single. Why not align himself with someone who is doing pretty good in this game, but more importantly, has the Big Brother audience? Johnny is aligning with Natalie for, for outside of the game. He wants yeah. that Big Brother audience. He wants those followers. So they both came into like kind of in a mutual agreement, I think. She was going to use him for whatever reason. He was going to use her for whatever reason. That's fine. Play the game like that. You're allowed to play the game how you want. But when you pretend to go on dates in New York City, when all of us know the truth about both of you, I think it's, it's foul. Like, they were not on a date. It was 100% staged because he was trying to get on Celebrity Big Brother it obviously failed because his ass is not on Celebrity Big Brother. <laughs> so that's kind of what pissed me off. It's like I know about both of you in real life. I know who Natalie's really dating, who's Johnny's really dating, this and that. And y'all are going to fake a date and try to make people believe that y'all are still together. I just think that's bullshit, and I think it's tacky. Again, you're allowed to do what you want to do, but I think it's on both of their parts. Yeah, from a viewer's perspective, we saw Johnny and Kaylee kind of flirting last night, and that seemed I mean, that seemed more ahead, genuine. Go ahead, I'm listening. As I say, that just seemed like a more genuine sort of like flirty exchange than anything that Johnny and Natalie have going on. But, yeah, when Natalie and Johnny are together, you can tell it's forced that they are both, you know, trying to make it a storyline or, as she calls it, a showman. Um, but with Kaylee and Johnny, I didn't realize that we were going to get to see that the Kaylee and Johnny stuff that early. I remember that night. I remember seeing them act like that. And I'm like, holy shit, that's how they're actually like sexually attracted to each other. There's actually chemistry there. <laughs> and, and there's going to be a lot of that to play out, too. That's definitely going to be a storyline to watch this season. Poor Nelson. <laughs> yeah. Nelson just can't catch a break. I feel like every season, <laughs> Nelson's trying to get a girlfriend on the show. It just never works out for the guy. I love Nelson. Y'all know Nelson is like my brother. I love this kid to death, and I warned him. I told him to stay away from Kaylee, <laughs> but he doesn't listen to me, and then all this shit's going to play out with him and Kaylee, and then I have to get involved, and it's just going to turn into a disaster, and he should have just listened to me from the beginning. <laughs> That's always the case with big sisters. People don't listen. Yeah, it's, just, it's so annoying. He doesn't listen, and then all of this is going to blow up in everyone's face very soon. So s sticking with the, the whole theme of the Brits, I forget. I saw this on Twitter, and I think it was one of the cast members, and I wish I could remember who exactly it was that brought this up. But they're not on the show. Sorry, it was a cast member that's normally on the challenge, but they weren't on this season. It might have been Wes, actually. But anyways, they brought up the fact that in normal seasons, and especially when all of the Are You The One cast started coming on, the goal was to automatically send those people out of the house. But this season, the same thing doesn't appear to be happening with the Brits. And why do you think that's the case? Um, I think with because we filmed Dirty 30 and Vendettas back to back and the time came was so quickly. I think that a lot of those 30-30 wombs were still open on that. People hadn't had time to talk in real life and kind of squash the beef. So we came in there and people came in there still pissed off about shit that happened on Dirty 30. <laughs> yeah. And if you're still mad about something, you're going to go after that person. You're going to overlook the new kid to kind of literally get that revenge on the person you're pissed off at. So I think because we filmed both seasons so closely and enough time hadn't passed for cast members to make up in real life, that that's why you see us kind of going after each other instead of the new kids in the beginning, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, also, Kyle is great. Kyle is, is – and Kaylee, too, in her, in her own ways. Like, they both kind of were really good at coming in and forming friendships really quickly, and people really like them. And they're like, oh, I like you, and you've never done anything to me. 
but here's someone that has done something to me, so I'll just go after that person and let you rise for a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, too, were you one of the people mesmerized by Josh's abs or no? God, no. I am not the type of girl that, like, he's, he's beautiful, don't get me wrong, but, like, I would never be attracted to a guy or want to fuck a guy that does any carbs. Like, it's just not <laughs> cool to me that I couldn't eat spaghetti on a date with you. So, no, I, no, he he's a beautiful man, but... He cares too much about like not eating carbs and eating salad all day, and I'm like, I need a real man, no thanks. You need garlic bread. Everyone needs garlic bread. Yeah, like he's just he's beautiful. Don't get he's just not the father. He's the father's thing for my type. <laughs> That's totally fair. Uh, we had uh, Wes on from uh, for Champs vs. Stars, and he was telling us that he thinks the like increased pace of challenge seasons is kind of taking a toll on the cast. He specifically said that he thinks that some of Camilla's problems were just exacerbated by her just being burnt out by being on too many seasons back to back. And you just mentioned that Vendetta's was like right on the tail of Chance vs. Stars and Dirty 30. Are you finding that that kind of pace that they're doing now where they have multiple seasons per year is hard on you personally? Yes, I, I mean... It's so hard to explain what this game does to you mentally unless you live it. I mean, y'all don't understand our eating situation and how sometimes we have the shittiest food, there's not enough food. Like, y'all don't understand the little things that go into it that can break you each day that you're there. So I absolutely think that a lot of Camilla's problems and issues and eventually her breakdown stem from her doing challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge and not having any real time off in the off season to take care of herself and to mentally just build herself back up. Um, And I think that we're going to see with these seasons being popped out like this, I think you're going to see more people just mentally break like Camilla and it's sad and it's terrifying, but people need to know when to say no. People need to know what they mentally can handle and what they can't handle. And there's some people, like, I think me and Veronica could do every fucking season and never mentally break because we understand what's real life and what's the challenge. Mm-hmm. But there are some people where the world the worlds collide so much that they can't relate and understand, okay, this is just a game. I'm just playing for money. This isn't real life. So with us putting out challenges like this nonstop, I think that you're going to see more people just mentally who can't handle it. Yeah, I believe it. It seems like it's a grind. And not that what we do is anything close to what you guys go through. But, like, I find podcasting about it every week is exhausting (laughs) to a point. So I don't know how you guys are living and breathing it for, like, six or seven weeks at a time. And then, like, on Twitter about it all the time, too. Yeah, and then you have to relive it when it airs. You have to relive it when when you're filming the reunion. No, it's definitely, I mean... Being mentally strong and mentally aware is are definitely benefits in this game, and it's, I mean, it's why I can stay around with these girls that are beasts, like, because there's no way I'm ever going to be a beast like Carr. It's just not in my DNA. But that's when I use my ability to play this game politically and use my mental awareness to help me get to where I need to go, so to speak. I understand. That makes sense. Uh, one person who seems to be struggling, at least from a viewer's perspective, and getting back into uh, house life is Brad. Oh, who, oh God. <laughs> who, like, um, his last season was cutthroat, and he seemed like a really, like, kind of chill, serious, smart guy on that season. And this season, he comes across, across as a bit of a maniac, but the way other people talk about him... They make it sound like he's crazy all the time. Are there some Brad stories that we haven't seen on TV that kind of underscore how he's changed? I mean, this is the first time doing a challenge with Brad, so I cannot speak to him and how he was before. But I think maniac is a great word to describe him. He's like one of these people who talk to him, and he just doesn't blink. And you're like, why are you not blinking, bro? Like, it's a little terrifying. Um, but in all honesty, like, he just would walk around the house constantly, like, on edge and trying to figure out what's going on. And it's like, bro, it's our day off. Chill. So I think it's just his, like, constant wanting to play the game and wanting to know what's going on and trying to control every move. 
is where he's getting this bad rep from of being kind of crazy. So he obviously he obviously has to chill a little bit when Britney's around to distract him. What do you think he would be like if the Britney thing wasn't a thing? Like, would he be even more crazy? I mean, thanks. He would start getting, like, really crazy. She would just, like, take him in a room and they would do what they needed to do. <laughs> um, I don't want to think about what Britney, if Britney wasn't there, because I do think Brad probably would have lost his mind if he wasn't with Britney. And I think that someone may have got, would probably get injured. I think it would probably be a Brad meltdown, um, Camilla style. So I'm kind of glad there to keep them under control. Just to get your... Uh, dude I just, is, he's mental. He's kind of out there in the challenge house. <laughs> I just want to get your opinion on some of the things that have happened so far in the house. Like, first off, like, sticking with Brad, obviously. What what was your take on the whole Pizzagate situation? The whole Pizzagate situation? Yeah. It's so funny. It's, it's such a ridiculous argument, and it's such a ridiculous <laughs> thing. But in that challenge house, when we, none of us had food for the past eight hours, 10 hours because of catering sucks so bad. It's a big deal. So it's just crazy watching it and how people are like, are they really fighting over pizza? And you're like, well, if you had eaten all day and it's midnight, you would be fighting over pizza too. Um, I, I think that Marie honestly was probably just trying to take pizza to her room for her other roommates. Hell, probably for herself because we need to take care of ourselves and eat in that house. Um, and I think that Brad just kind of went crazy over nothing. But that Brad for you, Brad's going to just flip out constantly this season over the smallest things. And I don't know, maybe that's who he is. Maybe that's how Brad is in real life. Or maybe just being back in the challenge house after an eight, nine year break. Maybe for what it's like to live in this environment. Uh, the next thing I kind of want to... Sorry. It's a lot more intense than it used to be. So I don't think he was used to all of this. And as a vet, actually came in as a vet in a totally new game ah okay okay the next thing i kind of want to ask you about especially because it seemed like you had a front row seat to it was a whole uh as we refer to her dj melly mel on this podcast <laughs> the whole little mel and kill a cam uh that seemed to be like a an interesting little showdown between the two crews and i know you said you're close with marie uh what's your relationship like with the rest of the crew that we've coined as the Suicide Squad, which would be Sylvia, Sylvia, Marie, Killa Cam, and Kayla. You seem Wait, to get what in. Y'all the, call them? We call them the Suicide Squad. Uh, the Suicide. That's hilarious. I love that. The Suicide Squad. Um, so obviously, me and Kayla came into this challenge with a lot of drama from Dirty Thirty, a lot of Twitter drama. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens, how me and her, either, you know, a different dynamic than that. Um, essentially, me and her kind of just talk to each other, and we realize we can't bring this dirty, dirty drama into vendettas. Mm -hmm. We need to make up and stay out of each other's way. As sure. far as Cam, I loved her from the moment I met her. I thought she was a very real bitch, and I'm like, she's the type of girl that I would, you know, fuck with in real life. Mm -hmm. Same with Sylvia. And then obviously I'm cool with Marie, always have been. But this Cam and Melissa fight. So Cam and DJ Mal is get in this fight. And y'all, this fight is going on for like 30 minutes. <laughs> I try to, I get Cam away from Melissa. She goes back. Me and Nelson get her away. I'm talking about this fight went on forever and ever and ever. Y'all, the very beginning and then the very end. So when all that happened with Melissa and I got involved, this was after like 30 minutes of me pulling Cam away and then telling Melissa, and I would literally have, like, Cam back up against the wall, and Melissa would just come back over there and keep instigating. Mm -hmm. So y'all see what looks like it's me and Cam kind of bullying or, or ganging up, whatever buzzword people want to use against Melissa, when in all honesty, I saved Melissa from Cam a hundred times, and Melissa wouldn't fucking stop. So at that point, I'm like, you're not going to stop. Like, what can I do? So that's kind of the thing. It does look like, oh, they're kind of ganging up on her. Absolutely fucking not. Melissa had plenty of times where Cam was removed and she could leave the argument and she kept coming back from. So her, like, play the victim is bullshit. She knew what she was doing. She wanted to rile Cam up. She wanted to see how far she could get Cam. And 
she kind of walked in. So then, my my other question to follow Wait, up. Wait, actually, have one more thing to say. Oh, no these problem. UK girls, Ailey, listen, you'll see it later with Kate. So they love playing the victim. They love, you know, oh my God, woe is me. I am the victim. The girls are ganging up on me. It's like, no, y'all keep doing shit and doing shit and doing shit, and then people are finally tired of your shit. <laughs> like, they come from exes on the beach. They come from a show where they're used to doing shit like this. So then playing the victim card makes no fucking sense. It's just we finally got fed up with their answers. Yeah, no, my follow-up was going to be because I saw the Twitter fallout, and so to hear your story now in terms of what actually happened, for Mel to then go online and perpetrate this whole oh, they were bullying me and having actual fans now go at you guys on Twitter for saying you guys were bullying her when clearly that's not what happened in real life, right? Like, how exactly. messed up is that? Just, oh, don't... <laughs> the whole bullying in a challenge house is... And playing the victim, it's like, this isn't church camp, this isn't high school, this <laughs> isn't, you know, a situation where someone can honestly be bullied. I understand that bullying is a very real thing yep. for a lot of people in their real life. But in a challenge house, everyone can take for themselves. We're all casted because we're... So from Melissa to act like a psycho for 45 minutes and then see three minutes of it and then she makes an entire YouTube video about her being victim and bullied, it's complete bullshit. All she's doing is playing the fans for sympathy. That's all she's doing. And kudos for her. She's playing the card very well. That girl may be a lot of things. A victim in the situation or being bullied is not one of them. So what, what was the whole thing with her and uh, Nicole? Like, Because I was wondering throughout that whole thing where Nicole was, but also just a bigger picture. Could you give us more background on just what was going on with the two of them in the house? Nicole was actually passed out, like throwing up. She Nicole got too drunk and was literally dying when all of this happened. She was throwing up, then she eventually passed out. And with them, it just kind of their little love situation, their little love fling started out of nowhere. But I thought it's genuine. They were kind of cute together. They seemed to really like each other. Melissa gave no fucks about her boyfriend at home. Like, <laughs> they were a little challenge fling. And then you hear in the interviews where Melissa's only hooking up with Nicole because she thinks it's going to help her game, so to speak. Um, smart idea, Melissa, but if you're trying to advance your game, you should probably hook up with someone in the Troika. Like, Nicole couldn't even save her with Tony. So Melissa had the right idea of let me, you know, hook up with someone to carry me to the end. You see girls do it every season. She just made a bad choice in who she chose. That's... I think next season, if Melissa comes back, she'll make a better decision. And I think Melissa has the capability of finding someone to carry her to the end. I think that's going to be the game that she plays in this challenge um, in the future. I think she's a good competitor, so she'll have a, a leg to stand on. But her main strategy is going to be find someone that will carry me to the end. That's exactly what I've been saying, is that she made a poor choice with Nicole. But I feel bad for Nicole because it seems like Nicole's feelings were really genuine. Don't feel bad for Nicole. Nicole falls in love every <laughs> five minutes. Nicole's going to fall in love 24 more times this season. Don't feel bad for that girl. <laughs> okay. There are more people to feel bad for in life. Nicole and falling in love is not one of them. <laughs> okay, I can do that. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. This is amazing because I know uh, for our, our normal regular listeners, they know that the reason why I appreciate this show so much is a social experiment of just putting a bunch of people into a house, for forcing them into different situations. But the thing I love the most is trying to figure out who's phony and who's not. And who's playing the game and trying to like play up for the camera and who's just actually them. And you, when I watch it on TV, you, like Marie, which is why she's also a favorite of You Killed It, seem like the people that, you know, if we sat down and had a beer, that's the exact same way that you would be. So it's I'm I'm happy to hear you like this now just like giving no fucks and like giving us the truths because there's a lot of stuff that gets faked in front of the camera right oh absolutely and i'm the type of person i went into my real world season with this mentality i go into every challenge with this mentality i am just gonna say what i feel i'm gonna do what i feel i'm just gonna live my life on camera as if i live my life every day in my real life 
And whatever gets edited is who I am, good or bad. There's bad moments, there are good moments. I can't control the edit. All I can control is who I am. And if I act normal and act like myself, then I'm going to be edited as I am. People coming in there that try to play one side and act another and kind of manipulate the cameras, those are the people that get a shit edit, and it's because they did it to themselves. I hate people being like, I got a bad edit. It's like, no, you didn't. You got the edit that you, you gave them the material, and they edit you the way that you are. Who do you think the most genuine person is in the house, aside from yourself, of course? Um, I mean, me and Veronica are really good friends. I think Veronica is always who she is on camera and off camera. I think that Leroy is who he is on camera and off camera. Nelson, um, Cara. I mean, they're, like how you see these people act on camera is how they act in real life. I just spent you know, the weekend with Leroy and Cara, um, and the way that they were acting there and the things that annoyed me about them when we were together is the same thing that annoyed me about them when they're on camera. The things that I love is the same. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, Cara, Nelson, uh, Veronica, Leroy, Marie, Marie is a little crazier on camera, <laughs> but that's just the mental game for her. It's not, that, it's not an act that Marie's putting on. It's just putting Marie in that situation stresses her out so she gets a little crazier but that's also marie in real life marie gets crazy in real life so i think she's another one that's genuine i think that in that situation she's a little bit crazier but that's just because of the stress of the game that makes sense you know people when they're under pressure it gets them a little bit and it's an aspect of their personality they're still being yeah people handle stress differently and it's just one of those things where some people it just kind of gets to them in that game so You've been on a bunch of different seasons of the challenge now, and you know, which every year gets more, you get more experience, obviously. I just want to know how you treat the game differently now than maybe your first few appearances on the challenge. I'm sorry, can you say that? <coughs> the ending? Sorry, no, I was just saying, like, what do you think the biggest differences are from how you treated the game, your game plan, let's say, from when you first came on the challenge? to now as you've been on the show for multiple seasons, right? Yeah. I mean, back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I mean my battle of the seasons, my rivals two, my exes two, those challenges, we always knew the schedule. We knew on Monday there would be a challenge, on Tuesday there would be an elimination, on Wednesday we would do interviews, on Thursday another challenge. So we always knew the schedule. Oh, and this really started on 2030, it went over to Vendettas, and I think it's the future of the challenge. We don't have a schedule. Production doesn't tell us shit. It could be midnight, and we might not know if there's a challenge or not. So they've kind of changed the game where they take away that, that one comfort thing that we had, knowing what each day was, and it gets seasonally now. So even though I'm a vet and all these other vets, we still have the advantage of knowing how things work, but we don't have that advantage anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's a game changer. It is as crazy as that sounds. Not knowing your schedule completely changes the game and makes it a lot more even playing field for rookies and vets. You did take a break from the challenge after Knight's passing. Aside uh -huh. from after aside from the uh, schedule change, what were the other big differences for you? And did you come into the when you returned to the challenge? Did you come in with a different approach at all in terms of strategy? Um, I mean, I came into Dirty Thirty. Um, Knowing after taking that break, knowing it was going to be a different game, it's a new group of people, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, so yeah, I came in just kind of, I'm going to re put myself back in this life and see what happens. But I think I fell back into it pretty easily. I kind of remember how to play the political game off the top of my head. Um, so it's one of the things I didn't know what to expect going into it, so I didn't go in with any expectations or any plans. I was like, once I get there, I'll figure out what's going on. Um, but I had a lot of coming into Vendettas. I was back, you know, I trusted my ability to play the game. I was back doing the challenges, so I felt a little bit more comfortable. So Dirty 30 was definitely getting my feet wet, and Vendettas, I had a lot more confidence coming in, being back, you know, as a vet, so to speak. I think that shows this season that you had more confidence. You do seem to be carrying yourself with, yeah, more confidence, a little more comfortable, a little more swagger, if you will. <laughs> no, absolutely. I needed to get my feet wet for Dirty 30. Dirty 30 was like preseason. I look at it like, you know, preseason football 
even Drew Brees is fucking up. But once their season <laughs> really actually starts is when you get kind of in the groove. And I feel like in that as I'm finally in my groove, so to speak. Can I ask you something? So I used to... I've worked on different reality shows here in Canada, like on a way smaller level than the challenge, obviously. But my job on that show was doing the questions for the confessionals. And can I tell you something in all honesty, the difference, the biggest difference in like how my day went was so dependent on who I was interviewing that day, because some people are just good at the confessionals and some people really suck. You are really good at it. How, do, how long did it take you to get to that point where you kind of figured out, okay, this is where I can give good sound bites or this is where I can get my jokes off or whatever or just speak my truth? Like, how long did it take you to sort of figure out that angle and how you could be so it, good at it? I love that you added that about how, like, when you're doing the interviews, people, some people gave you good days, some people gave you bad days. I always do my interviews. I'm always the last person on the interview schedule. Mm -hmm. And it's because production likes ending their day with me. Because they know that I'm going to sit in that chair and just be able to kind of get them through it. They're not going to have to coach me through anything. So I'm always the last person to do an interview strictly for production so they can end their day on a good note. Makes but I don't know. Sense. I don't know. People always ask me, like, about my interviews. And I just literally sit in that chair and, and I can kind of just tell the story without production even really having to give me a lot of feedback. I have a good memory. I remember everything, and I think that plays a lot in, into it. I can go in there, remember something that happened three days ago, and tell it like it just happened right then. But honestly, I, I don't know. I, I really enjoy interviews. I like sitting in that chair and telling the stories. So I think the fact that I enjoy it plays in my advantage. The fans are telling me this is the best one yet, that Vendetta is, is my best commentary yet. I <laughs> Again, I don't know. I just go in there. I say exactly what's on my mind. I don't think about it. I don't try to be funny. I don't try to tell jokes. I literally just go in there. I speak on what I feel and I leave. So it's just one of those things that I guess I kind of can do well. So I was going to ask you that. Like, do you have material when you're already going into the room or is it just all off the dome? Because Johnny is someone who I think he's like writing jokes as he goes in. That's what I get. That's a feeling I Johnny get Johnny definitely, let's say something happens on a Monday night and his interview isn't until Wednesday, he definitely goes to his room and writes into his journal what he's going to say. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. No, I'm the complete opposite. I just, and it's just my personality. Like, I'm the best when it's in the moment. So I just go in there. I'm like, okay, what's the question? And then whenever they say the question, I say the first thing that comes to my mind. Makes sense. How often... Uh, when you're filming, how often are those confessional interviews? Yeah, you, yeah, we usually do about two interviews a week, so to speak. Um, in the beginning, there's so many people to interview, so only the people that are really part of the storyline at the moment get interviewed. But the later in the season, the more people leave, the longer the interviews go. And all of our interviews same time length. It's not like I'm, me and Johnny are getting three hours in an interview chair and someone else is only getting 20 minutes. They just use more of our material, but everyone's interviews the same time frame, same questions are asked, just in different formats. So yeah, I mean, everyone has the same opportunity in that interview chair. That makes sense. Uh, you mentioned that you have a really good memory, but I want to talk about another aspect of your mind. I'm so curious about your dreams because you seem to be able to predict the future or gain <laughs> insight into things. We've seen it on the show when you predicted that Anissa was going to come back, but you also tweeted recently about it because you predicted that a girl you knew from like high school or something was going yeah, to get girl engaged. Yeah, girl, one of my New York friends, I had a dream that she was going to get engaged, and then like a week later, the bitch was engaged. <laughs> <laughs> so how do these dreams work? Like, are they different in some way from one of a regular dream or are all of your dreams kind of clairvoyant like how does I, it work first and foremost i am obsessed with dreams so i definitely like when i wake, wake up from a dream i like focus on it i think about i mean this literally this morning me and my best friend had a 20 minute conversation about a dream that i had so I, I i focus on it i kind of grow it kind of nurture it if that makes sense i have dream books so I think just over the years, I've learned to listen to my dreams. I don't think that I have any talent that someone else doesn't have. I think it's just when you nurture something and you grow something, and that's kind of what I've my dreams. As crazy as that sounds, um, I just really listen to them, and I kind of open my mind. I know it sounds okay. crazy, but it's just the truth. I open my mind, and I let it come to me, so to speak. And I've had 
a lot of dreams come true. Like recently, I texted my friend. I was like, hey, your, your niece is going to be born today. And she's like, she's not due for a week. I'm like, no, no, she's coming. Literally 45 minutes later, she texts me. She goes, yeah, she, she, was, she just was came. She was just born. <laughs> so it's one of those things that I literally just a dream that when I wake up, I kind of just like meditate on it and try to figure out what what I'm what message I need to take from it. That's crazy. That's very interesting. Do we? Get... It really is insane. Like I, it, it's crazy and it's it's weird to me when it happens. But it's one of those things that I've just kind of learned to to work with. I don't run from it. I work with it. And it's I mean, yeah, shit happens and then it happens in real life. Uh, do we get to see any more of that on this season? Because I remember it was kind of a big part in Dirty 30. Uh, do we get to see some of your dreams kind of come to light in this season? I of tried to think. I don't think that I had any... I don't think I don't think I did, to be honest with you. There was something, I can't remember what, that me and that I kept feeling, and, and I kept telling Brittany, and then it happened, but I can't remember what it was. But I did have a feeling this season about something... And then it happened, and, I, and Brittany was like, holy shit, you're right, it happened. But I can't remember if that was just a gut feeling or a dream. So I have, I have a very like weird question here, but fo- stick with me here for a second. I'm so interested all the time. I get excited when the club scenes happen. The reason why is because I'm so interested in the people watching. Who's doing what? Who's talking to who? Who's trying to get it in? Like, I'm interested in that. I love partying myself. I love going out and having a good time myself. So watching these people on a show do the same thing, I always find interesting. So my question for you is, how real is what we see? But then also, like, how is it shot? Like, how is it, what's your mentality like? Like, are you thinking this is going to get on camera or this is going to be a part of the show? Or are you just doing whatever, having fun? No, um, so we go out at night. That's kind of the truth, like exactly how you said people watching. That's kind of where I gather my most information about people. Uh-huh. So I try to, when I'm out at night, pay attention to everything that's going on because that's when I can kind of learn the most. Because people are so excited to go out, to be out of the house, to hear music, to be able just to kind of be relaxed, that people let their guard down when we're out. So it's, I love going out because that's when I really get to figure out what the fuck people are doing because <laughs> the guard is down. But when we go out, we're usually secluded from people because they don't want random people walking through the camera shot. Yeah. But, I mean, they literally just turn the cameras on and they let us go. And whatever footage they get, they get. So it's definitely like a very, like, just like a normal night out, so to speak. Except the cameras are rolling and we only have a certain time frame out. So people are getting extra drunk in those few hours. Who's your favorite person to go to the club with? Like, who's the best partier in the Challenge House? This is a good question. It honestly, like, depends on the day. Like, Nelson and Corey go, are they like to party? Me and always, like, getting white, like, boxes of wine. Um, Kyle, like, it just depends on the day. Just like in real life, how sometimes one of your friends is more fun than the other a certain night. It's just like that in the challenge house. Depending on what's going on, the best thing is going out at night before elimination. When people are up for elimination, it's always fun to see how they act. They either are super paranoid and they're not drinking and they're trying to have serious conversations or they're super stressed out so they're just getting really fucked up and they don't care what happens. So the people that are going into elimination are usually the most fun people to watch at a night when you're out. Uh, you mentioned wine and I'm a big wine drinker so I have to ask what's your favorite wine? And I don't just mean like red versus white but like get into like what your favorite brand is or bottle or Absolutely. I am a huge, uh, depends on my mood. Sometimes I do like white, sometimes I do like red. So I like both. I don't describe the only, I don't like to try it nay. Um, but I am a huge cab. Okay. Me too, me too. Yeah, so I am, I'm the type of person when I go to the liquor store by my house, I constantly try new bottles. I'm not a type of person that's always stuck on one bottle. Um, I always try new things. So I'm not really, I always need this one. That's why I do the wine. Um, so, so you get all of the different types and you can try all different types of wine. But I will tell you, I am a sucker for Moscato. A really cheap Moscato. Like Moscato, as tacky as it sounds. Moscato. All right. 
I, I'm the same way where I like to try new and different bottles at the very least so I can say like, oh, I like that. I don't like that. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm also like if I'm out in a restaurant and I have like two or three bottles and I'm interested in, I'm always like tell the waiter like, which one do you prefer or which one's like your best seller? Like I'm really big on letting other people make the, like choose my wine for me. Yeah, me too. I I totally see. I, Veronica I is a wine snob, though. She's not oh. like that. So when I'm with her, I'm like, Veronica, whatever you want to drink. I don't give a shit. You just pick because she's a wine snob. Yeah, yeah. Some people are definitely like that. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question about last night's episode and that uh, the party scene. Uh, Shane really got worked up. And I've I'm always curious about this. How much does it damage someone when they're up for nomination and they freak out and the stress gets to them. Because from a viewer's perspective, as soon as you freak out, you're basically done for. It, 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 do you I find mean, that's you the case? you literally see people who have been got sent home, wasn't even gonna, or wasn't even going to go to elimination, acted a fool that night, and then went into elimination. I mean, it happened to Jordan last season. I mean, it's happened to people every season. Um, the Shane and Victor thing... It's so funny, and I'll tell you all about it because you're obviously not going to see it. They have, like, a, le- a weird little crush on each other. <laughs> they, like, flirted with each other and, like, cuddled with each other, and some weird shit was going on with Shane and Victor. So that's why they both were so mad at each other. Uh-huh. So it's not like you just crossed your friend. It's like you crossed the person that you've been flirting with for the past few weeks. So that was kind of the, the drama behind the Victor-Shane stuff is they literally were flirting with each other. It was a weird little relationship. And then they turned on each other at the last moment. Interesting. Why do you think yeah. Why do you think they wouldn't show us more of that? Because they kind of hinted at it last night's episode, but they didn't really get into their flirtatious relationship. I mean, it sucks how much I'll truly miss, but it just comes down to editing and what fits in the time frame. And I think they just didn't have enough time with only, you know, 40 minutes of, you know, with every episode, take out the fucking commercials. They just don't have enough time to tell the entire story. And that kind of takes me to what really, I'm just going to speak on this, what really pissed me off last night's episode is um, at the challenge, TJ's like, these teams have been picked by random. And it's like, those teams were not chosen by random. And we did not know, it was not a genderless day. We knew it was a boys' day, and the Troika, which was Marie, Zach, and Tony, picked those fucking teams. That's why Tony and Zach and Bananas and Kyle and Kayla were on a team. Do you really think that's a random fucking team? And Mm. we knew it was a boys' day. That's why Brad was with Kaylee, Cam, and Nelson, who couldn't swim. And Marie purposely put herself on that team to kind of sabotage the challenge because Tony, Marie, and Zach all wanted Brad to go in. Oh. So the fact that even that what's really pissed me off is that they did not show that the Troika actually picked the team and that Marie and Tony and Zach set Brad up for failure. Like, that was such a big storyline. And for them to be like, oh, this is a genderless challenge and these teams were picked by random. No, they weren't. Like, that's a huge storyline that you're not telling. And you're taking part of the – um Marie, Tony, and Zach, really good strategy away from them. I thought that was personally fucked up. But I don't make the rules. <laughs> See, that's amazing because I actually wrote down, like, so we always talk about, like, what happened and break down each episode each week. So I'll always have a bunch of notes and stuff I'll write down or type out <laughs> as we as I watch the episode. And one of the things I wrote down was, wait, what do you mean this was picked randomly? Like, it just seemed odd. And, again, because I, like... I work in television, I do a lot of editing and producing and stuff. I always call out when they do the voiceovers afterwards. So you could tell that TJ saying that was a straight voiceover that they did afterwards. So I was like, okay, something here happened, but I didn't know what happened. And plus the teams just seemed not random at all, right? Like there were teams that were clearly stronger than others. So I'm thank you for pointing that out. But why do you think they would do that? That's the thing. I usually can figure out, like, oh, production, like I said, production just knew that the Shane and Victor storyline wasn't big enough to, to tell in this episode because it wasn't a thing that we're going to see later. Mm-hmm. I cannot figure out for the life of me 
why they did not just say the Troika picked the team. I, I, I don't know that. And I, it's been on my mind since last night. And like I said, it really pissed me off because Marie, Zach, and Tony, strat, their strategy was genius. They fucked Brad. Mm-hmm. And I, I have no idea why they MTV or did that. It makes no sense to me in all honesty. I agree. It, and it's been one of the big storylines all season is that everyone, basically everyone wants to get rid of Brad. So, like, why wouldn't they play to that since that was what happened? That's strange. No, I, I totally agree. I don't know what's going on um, with that and why they skipped over that storyline. And that's one thing that we'll never know. You know, it's one of the things that that's always going to live and die in production. So there's also been people online kind of alluding to Johnny Bananas kind of being like an undercover producer as well on the show. And maybe certain storylines, I think Corey was very big on this, certain storylines being tailored to benefit Johnny to make to ensure that he stays longer on the show. Do you buy into that at all? Um, absolutely. I think that um, I mean, Johnny's been around so long. He's giving them so much. I mean, this is his career, this is his job, whatever the fuck you want to call it. I definitely think that he gets some some extra privileges that other cast members don't get. 100% agree with that. Do I think it's right? No, but it's reality TV and shit happens and it's like, what can you do about it? Uh, I know you can't give away too many details for upcoming episodes of Vendettas, but does he get challenged by other competitors? Because there was... In last night's episode, a bunch of the guys basically all saying, like, we have to take Johnny out. Like, does anyone actually get the chance to step up to him and, like, take a good run at Johnny? I think that what's to come with the Johnny storyline and and what, those, what you're going to see is probably going to be so exciting to so many fans. There's definitely <laughs> shit coming, and... Um, I can't even put it into words. It's just like one of these storylines that's so good that you have to watch. Because definitely there's a shift in things. The tide is changing. And people are finally starting to realize what they need to do. And it's going to be really cool, I think, for fans to see. Awesome. I'm Honestly, this is one of the best seasons in a long time. In my it's, opinion. I'm... Whenever, we, whenever I have fun filming them and whenever I enjoy filming them... I usually know it's going to be a good season, and this one I had a lot of fun filming, so I, I, I knew that the fans were going to like it, and there's still so much good shit to come. Like, all of my favorite stuff that happened this season hasn't even aired yet. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm yeah, cute. I think that y'all have some amazing shit coming as, as from not even a fan's perspective, but from as podcasters, y'all are going to have so much con- good content coming your way. <laughs> That's what we love to hear. That's good. I'm curious, uh, Dirty 30 started, I thought, really hot out of the box. Like, it was really exciting at first. But then it, it seemed to really drag out um, and became, I guess, emotionally draining. Somewhere around the episode of Camilla's big meltdown yep, with Leroy. absolutely. It just, it kind of, it bogged down. And it was just, that episode in particular I found depressing to watch. But, um... Did you find that as well as a cast member that that season was just like maybe a little I mean, bit too long? As, as crazy as it sounds, by the time we, because I was in that final redemption challenge, you know, me, Veronica, Nisa, Brittany, and Cara. Yeah. By the time that redemption challenge came, we were like packing our bags just that morning, and me, Brittany, Anissa, and Veronica all look at each other, and we're like, fuck this shit. We don't want to <laughs> go back to that house. We yeah. can all get like we were all mentally checked out. We were all like, "Oh, we can eat all leave Columbia together and hang out, or we could go back to that hellhole." Yeah, and yeah, and so when they drag it along that far, from a, a cast member's perspective, you just don't care anymore. You're like, "Get me out of this place." So yeah, they learned their lessons with Dirty Thirty, and that does not happen on Vendettas. Thank God. What's been your uh, favorite season of the challenge that you've been on? Honestly, Rivals 2 was the best cast members ever. Every night we partied, we got into drama, like just something about that mix of people on Rivals 2. I mean, CT, Knight, Dion, Frank, like Nani. It was just 
Jasmine, just like some legends in that house that were really good at comp- comp- like competing, but they also were just fun every single night. Mm-hmm. So Rivals 2. Vendettas is right up there with it, though. I will tell you that. Is there anyone that you'd like to see come back on the challenge or who's never been on the challenge that you think I would love, love, love for Heather Cook to come back. Cook is one of my, like, best friends. I think that she could be one of the best challenge competitors ever to play this game if she came back. She's only did one. Um, Obviously, I would love to see Nani come back. I would love for Jasmine to come back. Just the girls that I kind of started with, I would love for some of them to come back. Yeah. No, that's really cool for sure. And I think you're right, too. I think Cook would be really, really good at the challenge if she did I mean, I would put my money on her against a lot of people. I think she's one of those girls that could take out anybody at anything. For sure. And obviously, she's my best friend, so I want her to come back because she's a strong competitor, so it benefits me. (laughs) I mean, let's be, I'm I'm no dummy here. Nothing (laughs) wrong with that. That's smart gameplay right there, right? Yeah. Uh, just a couple last things I wanted to get your opinion on. And uh, there's okay. a there's a lot of talk after last week's elimination between Melissa and Sylvia about it being one of the best eliminations, male or female, that we've seen on the challenge. You obviously had a front row seat to it. What was your, from your vantage point, what went down? How was it? What, talk to me about the cheap shots Melissa was getting, or giving, sorry. Just, it seemed great. I just want to hear a perspective from you having a front row seat. Honestly, and this is this goes for a lot of eliminations this season. This is one of the eliminations. You're going to see a few more like this. It went on for over an hour. Like, y'all don't realize how long these eliminations really last because people are just fighting and fighting and not giving up. This elimination went on forever. It's mm-hmm. freezing. They're both in this water. So it was literally just so fucking good to watch these two girls go at it Mm -hmm. yeah melissa was taking a few cheap shots um sylvia's a beast though that just kind of added fuel to her fire i think melissa actually fucked herself by doing that because all she did was piss sylvia off Mm -hmm. um i i don't know i like it's so insane watching it and then seeing it air again because you get kind of relive it but i've never seen two girls go at it that hard in elimination in all of my challenge seasons Can I ask something too? Like you've obviously been in eliminations, but I don't know if you've been in one where the people watching are so clearly rooting for one person as opposed to the other. I just wonder like what that feeling must be like, A, either watching or B, being one of those people where either... Oh, I've actually kind of been there. I remember on Rivals 2, the last elimination before the final, me and Camilla went in against Anissa and Diem, and everyone was cheering for Anissa and Diem. Ah. And I mean, all that did was all that did was piss Camilla off. <laughs> and I'm just like, like, when Camilla's mad and I'm her teammate, I'm like, all right, well, I need to get mad too, or she's gonna be a psycho later. <laughs> I'm gonna go home with her. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can for a lot of people, it just adds fuel to your fire. A lot of people, it kind of gets to them mentally. So the entire crowd cheering for someone else could either really play in your advantage mm-hmm. or bring you down, depending on how you think mentally. Okay, I like that. I like that. My one last question I have for you, Jemmy, is about uh, just how much things have changed in this era where there's Twitter. Because there's two different shows almost going on, right? Like, I'll watch the episode, I'll take my notes, and then I'll make sure I'll go to certain Twitter feeds, <laughs> right? Because some of you guys are just spitting fire, right? And it's it's just become such another, it's almost like another part of the show. Just what's going on on Twitter and Obviously, with Kara and Kayla was a big thing. You mentioned yourself and Kayla. Like, how much of a how much of that stuff is real? And then, like, how much does it change when you then see the person again in real life? How much of that stuff gets brought up? Whenever I see a fan tweet like, "Oh, they're just having Twitter beef," or production is telling them to have a Twitter beef, production doesn't have to tell us psychos to have Twitter beef. We <laughs> do it all on our own because we're all insane. <laughs> So all the Twitter shit is real. People are just crazy. They're mad. They're whatever reason we do it. Call. I mean, it's insane, but it's honestly real. And then you see that person, and y'all either choose to make up and be done with it, or you keep it going. It all just depends on the circumstances you see each other. Sometimes other people will get involved. Say, for example, if two people 
that I consider my alliance or having Twitter beef, I would try to get them to make up because I don't want them into it. If two people I don't like are in a Twitter beef, I want them to continue it. So it's just an extra part of the game that wasn't here years ago. Mm -hmm. Shit can go down. I mean, think about it. Frank and Johnny were partners on Rivals 2 because of Twitter beef. Mm -hmm. Tony and Brad are vendettas because of Twitter beef. So essentially, the social media drama Leak, like leaks over into the gameplay every season now. And for the record, I'm here for it. I'm here for it all. I yeah. am too. Like, fuck <laughs> it. It's like an entire, like, you get to see this shit happen in the house, and then you get to see us go at it in real time on Twitter. I'm here for it too. I think it's part of the, the show and part of kind of what who we are these days. So I'm definitely here for it. For me, it's not just the, <laughs> the beefing on Twitter, which, like, don't get me wrong. I love it. Like, I'm into it. But the I like watching you guys kind of discover the things you missed when you're in the house. Like the Shane not actually lying and being kind of asleep when that note exactly. was dropped off. That sort of or stuff a like conversation that you didn't know happened. Exactly. It's, like it's, it's fun crazy, getting it's crazy seeing shit that you didn't know that went down and cause then you have to sit on you have you sit there and think about it. Like what the fuck? How did I miss that? Yeah, it's fun watching you guys kind of react to the show in real time too and getting like the behind the scenes details not just the beefing but like sylvia uh last week giving props to mel on twitter being like hey like it was hard fought and it got dirty but like i gotta give you credit like that was an incredible challenge like an incredible thing that we did it's cool. No, I agree. It's definitely a part of it and i think it um all it does is just kind of add to more drama and more things for the fans to enjoy. So I'm definitely here for it. I mean, think of, I mean, look, me and Johnny are in this huge Twitter war and we were a lot, we were literally in an alliance and on good terms in the challenge house and look at us now, we hate each other. So it's just crazy how those tides can turn and people that you had no drama with in the challenge house turns into Twitter drama over and, and it all is over my curse theory and me calling him overrated in the first episode. Oh, that's where it all, that's what I was going to ask you. That's where it all started and just off that? Yeah, yeah. So people, like, me and Johnny are cool the entire season. We are literally in an alliance. You're going to see him look out for me, me look out for him. Like, us literally have each other's back. And he watches the first episode. He hears me say, you know, bring up a curse again. And he's so fucking bitter about this curse theory <laughs> that it, he literally tweets me once a week reminding me that he thinks I'm ugly or fat. It's like, Johnny, I know how you feel about me. It's not going to change the fact that you're cursed. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably so, yeah, adding to his curse. It's crazy how you can be aligned with someone and then it turns into a Twitter beast. And, you know, it's just, it's a crazy world that we're playing this game in. He says some really terrible, terrible things. I, I'm glad to hear and actually watch you just like joust back at him. Just because, like, it's, he comes off as a huge douche with some of the things he says. Yeah, I mean, Johnny, at the end of the day, he's a 35-year-old man who feels the need to go on Twitter and call a girl ugly or fat just because I have a, 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 an idea that he's cursed. Like, that's fucking pathetic to me. Like, and I've never, I'm the type of person, I do talk a lot of shit. I do always kind of spill the tea or clap back on Twitter. But I would never attack someone's appearance. Um, It's just not right. So Johnny's just fucking whack. But that's who he is. He's very fucking selfish. And who he is on Twitter when he's calling me ugly, that's the real Johnny. And if people choose to still like him, that's totally okay. But now people are kind of seeing his true colors, I think. And it's going to happen in the game. People are going to start to see his true colors and make some decisions. Yeah, I have to say I really dislike how Johnny has spoken to you and some of the other women uh, on the cast on Twitter and like I think he does put on sort of a front where he's a little nicer and definitely more charismatic on TV but when he's on Twitter I I hate it when he gets personal like that and makes attacks on people well let me let me put it like this he it's not that he puts on a front on television because Johnny definitely said some some mean things on on, on TV but He's production's golden boy, so they edit that shit out. They're not going to show Johnny attacking a girl for her looks or her weight on television. They simply edit that out. So on Twitter, you just get to see the real him when he doesn't have people edit him. 
Honestly, I, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about Johnny, I wanted him to go on Celebrity Big Brother. I was actually hoping he was on Celebrity Big Brother because you can't edit that show. That show, film, you know, how it's like live and people yeah. see shit all the time. People would have saw the real Johnny if he did Celebrity Big Brother. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to go on that show because I knew that he would bury himself. That's a very good. Thing. That's a good point. Uh, I'm curious. They haven't filmed the reunion special yet, have they? No. Yeah, that's so that's probably gonna. It sounds <laughs> yeah. like it's gonna be yeah. heated in a bunch of directions. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for the reunion. I, I'll say that much. <laughs> <laughs> Those always seem like the tensest days that you guys have like the hardest days where all this stuff is being opened up and people seem so upset and angry um what, what is shooting a reunion special like dirty 30 reunion with all of us there um that was the most draining day ever we filmed for like 12 13 hours um, that reunion was miserable. I usually enjoy the reunions um, because you get kind of air all the dirty laundry one final time, get to say your final thoughts. Dirty 30 reunion was miserable. I think that the Vendetta's reunion, I think it's going to be a good fucking time, and I think it's going to end up being a good episode for people to watch because all the dirty laundry is finally going to be aired out. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to this reunion, but Dirty 30, just like the season, the reunion lasted too long. It should have ended way sooner. It was one of those things. So I'm, I'm glad to be done with 3030, and I have, like, bigger expectations from the Vendetta's reunion. That is amazing, and I can't wait for the reunion special, but much more than that, obviously, I can't wait to watch the rest of this season and how it plays out because it's been so much fun so far, and I just want to thank you for coming on with us and giving us, spilling the tea and giving us a behind-the-scenes look, unlike I think anyone else could so far, Jemmy. So I'd like to thank you for coming on with us, because we really no, appreciate it. Thank y'all for having me, and I will tell y'all, like, I love the podcast. I know that fans appreciate podcasts like this, so we appreciate y'all. Honestly, from the cast members' perspective, we, ap we appreciate people like y'all doing these podcasts. And giving the fans the opportunity to kind of hear the behind the scenes things. Um, so we appreciate y'all just as much as y'all appreciate us. Oh, thanks so much. You know, I don't know how much you know about our background, but Sheldon and I are both uh, sports journalists. So we take this super serious. Like, we kind of bring <laughs> our careers to watching the challenge. And so we always appreciate the kind words of the cast members because you're the guys that have lived this experience and we're just sort of reflecting back your own lives. So it means so much when you have kind things to say about our podcast. No, y'all, we appreciate it. Um, and I know the fans really do. So thank y'all. That was amazing. I want to say that Jemmy is amazing, right? And people that listen to us week after week, you know that my favorite people on this show are the people that keep it real. The people that I feel like they're the exact same, whether the cameras are on or off, but the people that shoot straight from the hip. There's no BS. There's no bullshit. And as you could just hear, Jemmy is no filter, and I love it. That was a great conversation. So much information. So much fun. Like, yeah, I... I thought that was awesome. One of our best ones. I, I agree. And Jemmy was just so nice. Not just like what you heard, but the conversation we had uh, to start things off because, you know, we got to figure out the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. And even uh, the DMs that she and I have sent each other just to set up the interview. She's just a kind person yeah. and a very real person, which ironically, I don't think you get a lot on reality TV, which she touched on. Yeah. But I think that people have to put on facades because you know it's their public face versus their private face mm -hmm. that's not a criticism anyone would do it mm -hmm. i think i think i even do it between my personal life and being my not that i'm a celebrity but like my kind of public face as a journalist yeah you have to so it was so good to have just such a real authentic conversation uh one of my dudes i work with i work on a television show in canada a sports television show basically like the Canadian PTI, as I know that most of our listeners are from the States, 
But uh, one of the hosts of our shows, a guy I've worked under for a very long time, and I remember he would always tell me about going on air. The biggest thing is finding out who the real, who you are really on air, which mm-hmm. means obviously you're going to be different, but you need to find who you are on the air. And so watching this show and, and figuring that out, Jemmy clearly is someone who has figured out who she is on air. And it's not too far from who she is off the air. No, uh, no. And that I, works for her. And yeah. I, I think, you know, we talked a lot about Johnny Bananas in this in this interview with Jemmy. And I think that he's a perfect example of someone who is still trying to figure out, you know, that line. Like, I think he knows who he is, but it's still kind of very weird and yeah. comes off as very... Because we, we talked to Emily before, right? And in case you haven't listened to the Emily interview, just go back to wherever you found this episode. Scroll down a little and you'll find that conversation. But Emily, who's someone I feel like is a great judge of character... She loves Johnny yeah. and, and sings his praises. So it's very interesting. And, and, and the thing that I'm really loving about doing this podcast, which we started for complete fun, is now we get to hear actual firsthand experiences and get like that insight yeah. from people who are there. And I, I think that's the most amazing part of this. Because this is awesome for because we're fans of the show. Like yeah. I like watching the show. I enjoy watching it. So talking to people about it is awesome. Not to get all highbrow about this, but <laughs> okay. but that's kind of my brand. Um, <laughs> one of the things I love about the interviews we've done, the two interviews we've done with Wes, the interview with Marie, the interview with Emily, and now the interview with Jemmy, is seeing how being on reality TV has affected their lives. Yeah. And like you're always talking about the social experiment part, but mm-hmm. that, I feel like when you talk about that, you mean how they behave in the, in the house, house. Yeah, yeah. where I'm interested in how being on reality TV ah, affects their real life. Out of the house, yeah, yeah. Out of the house. I got you. And, you know, I've asked Wes about that. I had asked Emily and Marie about that. And it's interesting to hear that it seems like Jemmy, of any of them, has really combined her house life and her real life the most, but also that gives her the most perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, because she's so authentic in the house she doesn't have to code switch i yeah, guess yeah, is the yeah, best yeah, way to yeah, put yeah, it yeah, yeah. not to use a racial term yeah, but yeah, yeah. To, she doesn't have to code switch between when she's in the house and outside of the house yeah. and so it makes her a lot more likable and i think it's made her life her personal life a lot healthier it mm-hmm. sounds like yeah so anyway i thought that was a fantastic interview and we learned so much about what's going on in the yeah. vendetta house too ah we learned so much and obviously there's a great trailer at the end of last night's episode that tells us that backs up exactly what jemmy told us that there's a lot more shit that's about to go down in the house it's about to go (laughs) down as every rapper ever has said (laughs) so good can't wait to see what happens next um i don't know do we still pick like who killed it in last night's episode sure is that a thing that we're gonna do yes i my uh the person who killed it for me, though, is going to be influenced by what Jemmy said. <laughs> so you go ahead. Um, the person who killed it for me in this episode... Uh, this sucks for me to say. But I, I, I think it has to be Johnny. What? The reason why I'm saying this is because somehow, some way. This guy is in control of the house at this moment, at this particular moment right now. I'm not talking about what's going to happen down the line. I'm talking about at this moment, from everything we've seen right now, he is somehow in control of the house again. And he was in total control of that, uh, that, uh, what's it called? The The troika. The troika. But the Inquisition. He was running the yard. You got Tony, for some reason, calling him Michael Jordan, which, yes, I understand he has the most championships and wins in the challenge. So, like on some level that kind of makes sense but like on the other level that we're talking about michael jordan that's complete and utter disrespect (laughs) but again with that said at this moment and i think things are going to fall apart for johnny but at this moment he is in complete control of the house and he you add another win to him again so he's in the troika again they basically all came to that table in the inquisition to kiss his ass well at least shane did (laughs) <laughs> right and uh, i don't know i don't know how he's doing it and again it's gonna fall apart for him but as of right now do you know what i almost want to change but i'm not going to oh i was gonna say, I'm gonna say i almost want to change 
Because I, I should be giving a lot of love to Tony. Because what Tony did was just crazy. Well, fortunately, I get to say who I think killed it. Hey! And I'm picking Tony. See, that was like a <laughs> Pippin to Jordan pass right there. That's kind of what we did there. Yes. I was Pippin, I pass it to Jordan. Now you just throw it down. Yeah, you just gave me the alley-oop. <laughs> um, I'm going with Tony. And I'll tell you why. First of all, as we just learned from Jemmy, mm -hmm. last week's Troika of Marie, Zach, and Tony picked the teams. Yes. And they're the ones that got Brad straight into elimination. Mm -hmm. Big move, necessary move. Mm -hmm. Tony, on top of that, did the whole 150 feet or whatever it was underwater without using the air filling station. He skipped stations. two of them, I think he said. Yeah. yeah, there was three. He skipped two of them. Mm -hmm. And he's doing well in the Troika. Like, he's making moves. Mm -hmm. And still, I think Johnny is going to take all the blowback, which is an ideal situation. For sure. The one thing I'll say against Tony okay. is the Michael Jordan metaphor. <laughs> yeah. It's not that it's too strong. It's that it's incorrect. Oh. Because if, you're, if you want to say that, you know, Johnny Bananas has the most championships, he's the Michael Jordan, that's not correct. You should be going with Bill Russell. Because, ah. like, if you're if you're gonna drop NBA <laughs> history knowledge, <laughs> it's true. That's like, fair. come correct, Tony. Bill Russell has the most NBA championships. The other thing too, the other thing too, to stay <laughs> with that is that he's Scottie Pippen. If I count correctly, Scottie Pippen also has as many rings as MJ. And I don't think Tony has as many rings. I'm, as not, I'm just gonna check. No, Tony has no rings. <laughs> Tony has no rings. So. Bill Russell is, and the other problem is Bill Russell, infamous team player. Yeah. Johnny Banana is not a team player. Although, fair, fair. Where's the guise of being a team player? That's fair. That's fair. So Tony, for me, killed it this week. I I can't argue with that. I'm not going to argue that at all. We got to get going though. Yep. Uh, next week, I believe it'll be a regular, regularly scheduled episode of You Killed It. Maybe we could be working. On, there could be some stuff going on behind it's, the scenes. It's to the That's all I'll say. That's it's all I'll say. To the point now where I don't know. We're having like private conversations with several cast members <laughs> all the time. So who knows who we're going to get on? But it was awesome getting Jemmy on again. Yeah. Thank you, Jemmy, for your time. It was she a great is talk. Awesome. She is super awesome. Uh, if you need to get me on Twitter, I'm at J Chidley Hill. And I am on Twitter at Shell Alexander and on Instagram at Sheldon Alexander. And again, stay tuned because there's some stuff bubbling behind the scenes. So we'll let you know when details get confirmed, but stay tuned. That's what <laughs> I'll say. That's a tease. And until next week, this was You Killed It. You Killed It.